Today we have Anne-Marie Fine, Community Engagement Sergeant for Redmond Police Department. Also, we have Nicole Perry, Crime Analyst for the Greater Puget Sound Financial Fraud and ID Theft Task Force for the Redmond Police Department. And now I'd like to turn it over to Anne-Marie Fine. Good morning. Is my screen sharing okay? Yep, it looks good. Wonderful, thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me this morning. I really appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to share just a little bit about, about what's happening here in Redmond. Um, I know it's a concern to small businesses and to those visiting Redmond that, uh, you know, as you hear in the news, crime is on the rise. And, um, and, and Redmond is no exception with that. We do have um, a lot more calls for police service uh, especially with our population rising and more people coming back to work, which makes our daily population larger. Uh, I do want to go over some of the some of the uh, physical crimes we'll see, and then um, my co-host there, Nicole Perry, who's coming up later, she's going to talk a little bit about fraud and uh, internet crimes as well. So let's get started with the um, the physical crimes, and um, we'll just talk a little bit about what's going on in Redmond. Okay, so. First, we'll talk about some of the, the physical crimes that are happening in Redmond that we see you know, most frequently. First is shoplifting or theft from businesses. And this is just really an overview about what, what every um, type of crime is, what it's defined as. We also see quite a few commercial burglaries. That's going to be breaking into a business when a business is closed. It's closed to the public, unoccupied. And then robbery, of course, is um, an extremely serious crime where it's taking the property while the business is open or by a threatened use of force or a threat to injure or, um, or damage property. So let's get just started here with shoplifting and theft. Uh, thefts from inside commercial locations is really common for the Redmond Police Department, but it's often underreported. Uh, the reason why we say it's underreported is because, um, as you know, many times theft from a business is not, um, it's not reported till after the fact, or it's never reported at all if maybe um, someone steals an item from a business and it's not uh, found to be missing for maybe, you know, 10 days, 20 days, or when inventory is done. So um, we've looked at shoplifts in 2021. We had 400 shoplifts re reported. We know that that is a, um, unreported number, maybe because businesses don't have the staff right now to call us and to tell us about the crimes, or maybe because it's a small item and it's not worth the time to take staff off the floor to talk to police. Uh, when looking at the times that businesses are calling in and telling us about the crimes that are occurring about the shoplifts or the thefts, most are occurring between 4 and 8 p.m. We see this a lot with the larger stores as well. Closer to closing time, uh, maybe when uh, those associates on the floor are busy or they are um, lower in staff numbers and um, trying to close things up for the day, uh, thieves will go in and select more items. And uh, that seems to be a popular time, um, whether it's because of staffing or um, just people active with other things. So staff will typically be the first one to notice the crime of shoplifting. And um, what we do recommend is have a policy in place for your employees to make your expectations clear about what you expect if someone is stealing from your business. Uh, maybe alerting a coworker to your suspicions, maybe having a code word or something that will alert someone that this is what you're seeing, maybe telling them that you need a certain item or, hey, can you bring me the, you know, a certain phone or can you call so-and-so? That would mean that you're actually seeing someone steal something or you have suspicions. Please call 911 before approach, approaching the subject or delegating the role. We see sometimes people approach the sub subject and there's an unpredictable outcome and by that time, then um, you're in a reactionary mode to not only retreat, but then also to call police. Especially if you're alone at the business, we'd recommend just making the phone call 
and not being confrontational. And please make sure that your staff knows that it's people above product. Shoplifting has become increasingly um, increasingly unpredictable, I'll say, because we just don't know what people's intentions are and we don't know what's going on in their lives, whether they are stealing um, just for money or if there's a um, maybe some type of mental crisis going on as well. And when we talk about shoplifting and theft, I know online we've probably seen videos of these large groups coming into a store stealing high price high price merchandise, flooding an item or flooding a store just to get um, several items and then running out very quickly. Uh, really, there's, um, there's very little in the ways of prevention that um, stores can do when a large group enters their building. Really um, limiting inventory, um, movement of high value items, and then of course, keeping serial numbers if you are selling a product that has quite a few serial numbers, we would like um, the police will be able to locate and identify your stolen items if you have those numbers available to us. That is one thing we noticed with any kind of theft, whether it's a residential or a commercial theft, we just don't see a lot of people being able to provide us those serial numbers. Oh, my, you know, my iPad was stolen or, um, or a, a camera was stolen. All of those contain serial numbers. And if you keep a, an inclusive list, we will be able to identify your items, whether they're um, located in someone else's property or if they're pawned later as well. Um, we also wanna talk a little bit about theft of employee devices or purses. This happens commonly in office settings when maybe uh, someone walks in maybe uh, says they're delivering something or looking for someone, distracts someone behind a desk or even waits outside a business to see someone at the front desk leave. Uh, that thief will then enter the building, come in and search very quickly for whatever's at that desk, search for personal belongings. And also um, sometimes if businesses have um, rear door access, then things like break room security is an issue as well. So please, if you can, provide locked drawers, locked um, lockers, things like that for your employees' personal belongings. It will keep them safer. Talk a little bit about the shoplifting we're seeing right now. If you look so far um, in the first quarter here of 2022, we've had 128 shoplifts reported to us. So if we continue on that rate, we'll be over 500 by the end of the year. That's the highest number you'll see on the graph for any of the years. Uh, really in 2018 and 2019, we were headed up. And then with COVID and a lot of the stores closing, having limited hours, less people inside, we see a decrease, but it is rising steadily. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about robbery. So any theft can become a robbery if the subject is going to uh, use force or threaten to harm you. Year to date, we've had 19 robberies. That's a huge number for us. Uh, I will say those are not all related to uh, thefts in businesses or stores. Some of those are robberies where maybe uh, someone is approached in a parking lot and they're um, demanded that they're, they hand over their car or their purse or something like that. Some of them are even um, someone that's entered your home and stolen, um, stolen something from your residence while you've been at home that is considered a robbery. So um, when we look at businesses that are um, maybe a higher target for robberies, that's always in the past been banks. That's really where you only hear about a robbery occurring or maybe um, things like uh, currently we're seeing cannabis stores being the targets because large amounts of cash are on hand. But we are also seeing an increase with businesses that have alcohol on hand as well, or um, places where a thief has just gone in and asked for the cash drawer and then presented something like pepper spray, a knife, or a firearm to, to uh, get the worker to comply with their demands. You always wanna be um, aware of opening and closing times. 
It's usually when there's maybe one person working alone or they have to bring in uh, money for the cash drawer or they're bringing money out. So please vary the times that people arrive and leave or vary the times that you are bringing, um, you're bringing cash in and out of the store. Please, if you can, have employees park together to make leaving the business safer so you can travel in pairs, if at all able. And that really goes for any kind of office building where people are leaving, especially if it's not well lit or if um, it's later at night and um, you can have those employees travel together is always better. If you do have a concern also at your business, the Redmond Police has absolutely been known to come and help people get to their cars too. If you ever seen something that's suspicious and you have concerns about leaving the safety of your business. Just looking at robberies here, like I mentioned, um, we've had a significant rise. So seven of the 19 that I could find were specifically during a shoplifting in incident that um, the, the, the perpetrator raised the seriousness by presenting a weapon or threatening to harm somebody. Uh, if you look at our previous years, we averaged about two per month maybe. So this is a, um, a higher concern for us. And really um, we're trying to be in a lot of those commercial districts more often as staffing allows and as call volume allows, we're trying to be in, um, in these large complexes that house multiple businesses. We'll talk a little bit about commercial burglary. This is, um, this is maybe the, um, the crime that Redmond business owners see most often, only because uh, it is such a, a, a huge hit to, your, to your, um, your feeling of comfort in your business. And it also is a huge financial hit depending on how somebody has come in and entered your business. Uh, the typical entryways are defeated locks, broken windows, and um, just leaving doors open. So exterior deterrence that we, um, we come talk about to businesses a lot, and we, um, we try to get people to install, are having these obvious cameras and having adequate lighting or motion lights that will turn on if somebody comes across like the rear of your building. Always, um, we try to encourage a clear line of sight to the roadway and to parking lots. So if your business has maybe a lot of maintenance vehicles and you park right in front of the business, maybe that um, it might keep your, your vehicles on camera, but it also blocks the front door of your business and creates that barrier. Uh, for point of entry, um, having strong locks is extremely important. If you have uh, multiple keys out that have been copied, uh, you might need to look into a key card or some type of code entry system. I always want to keep in mind that after an employee separation, are you going to be able to get those items back? And if you can't, will your business be secure? Uh, also, um, Reinforcing glass doors with either protective film or changing to plexiglass can be very helpful. Uh, I would really encourage the protective film or plexiglass on any glass doors on the front of your on the front of your business, and also glass break alarms. This is a, a huge um, a huge help to monitor alarm systems. If you're hearing a glass break plus motion alarm. Uh, that will set off your, um, your monitor alarm very quickly. And we'll talk here a little bit about different types of alarms. And interior deterrence, again, obvious cameras. A lot of times people that are coming into these businesses have maybe uh, came in and done a little bit of a stakeout beforehand. And if they have seen that there's no cameras, they might be more inclined to come back. And then audible alarms for motions, motion uh, open doors and glass break. Uh, one thing we're seeing is a lot of the web-based cameras, although great because um, an employee can log on at any time and see what's going on, they don't come with an audible alarm. And the audible alarm is, you know, if you don't push in the right code uh, after making entry, 
you hear the beep, if it, that right code is entered after 30 seconds, there's a loud alarm going off. And those are always, um, they're always very helpful uh, in limiting the time that a burglar has to come into your res or to come into your business. For commercial burglaries, um, we see most uh, most of our burglaries in the central or grassland districts. That's where central is a uh, downtown where uh, a majority of the uh, commercial retail businesses are, and grassland where um, obviously that's up the Willows area where there's a lot of construction going on right now. Construction sites are included as well in commercial burglaries, as well as um, uh, lots of businesses that are really only open on the weekdays. So we see most of these occur on weekends or long holiday weekends. And again, you'll see here in January, February, March of this year, we are up as well, um, looking at the 2021 numbers, we have about the same, the same high rate, uh, anywhere from you know, 15 to 25. I would also say that one thing that really helps in commercial burglaries is using a heavy fireproof safe and making sure it's bolted to a floor or um, a, a strong wall and keeping any high value items locked away, something like if, you're, uh, compute, if your business uses a lot of um, iPads or tablets, or if um, you have employee uh, records such as social security numbers and um, payment details out and about, I would really suggest that those get stored in a safe. Uh, these will come in, they'll look in drawers, usually file cabinet drawers are pretty easy to pry open. Uh, safes are obviously much harder. When we talk about alarms, there's benefits um, to both cloud-based and professionally monitored alarms. There's also some hindrances. So cloud-based, um, so maybe uh, we're talking here about somebody coming in and installing some cameras, and then you have access to it on your phone or tablet at any time, or maybe you have installed the cameras as well. And then you're monitoring that system on your own. So that's a great benefit because you can log in, you can check opening and closing, you can see what's being done. You can even check up on employees if needed. Uh, the motion alerts and alarms will go directly to you, to your phone or tablet. So sometimes that's a little bit difficult because we all need to sleep and it's difficult to verify the alarm or alert. So it might go off a couple of times, you wake up, now you have to slide back because you're not seeing anything figure out what that alert, what that alarm was for, and then whether or not you uh, have cause to call your local police department. Um, and also some of those web-based ones lack the audible alarm option. So professionally monitored, um, usually higher price to install and to monitor as well. You'll have false alarm or employee issues. I will say in Redmond, we do not have a... Um, we don't have a fine for false alarms, things like that. So um, that shouldn't be a hindrance to you. Uh, alarm verification will be quicker and make police response quicker as well. So if you have a monitored alarm and somebody can come and, uh, or if someone is viewing that on the screen, we've had um, a number of burglaries where uh, someone is monitoring offsite and they're telling us what room the person is in, what they're wearing, what they're doing. And um, it's a huge asset for police response. It keeps us safer and we're actually able to, um, to really close up around that person uh, it, very quickly with less chance of an escape. And then usually for professionally monitored, um, if someone's coming in to install, then you might have um, maybe better coverage. Also an alarm, an audible alarm system is very helpful in these situations. We've talked about that already. Let's just switch gears a little bit here and talk about crime prevention through environmental design. So really what is going to make your business um, less attractive to criminals? Really in Redmond, what we want to do is um, if a criminal is looking at your store, your business, your office complex, what 
would be um, a hindrance to them. And they're looking at like, no, I'm gonna skip that one. And instead they'll go to your neighbor. What we wanna do here in Redmond is talk to all the neighbors and get everybody practicing kind of the same, um, the same crime prevention through environmental design and hopefully um, people that are interested in whether it's theft or burglary are going to bypass these businesses and move on to another jurisdiction. <laughs> and so really what we're looking at here, and I know every, this is small and everyone will have access to this, is what can you do and take an assessment from outside your business, what can you do to uh, reduce the access to your business, show that you own a territory, um, what can you do as far as maintenance as well? So if you are interested, the Redmond Police Department will come out and they'll come to your, um, to your residence or to your business and we can talk about these things. We can give you some tips. We can talk about um, maintenance of uh, landscaping, for instance, to really assist in the view in and out of the property. We really want to um, to reduce overgrown shrubs, things like that, and show a clean, distinct territory that is being cared for. And that will indicate to a thief that this place is well-maintained, therefore probably is maintained on the inside as well. So really um, also, what else can we do to, um, to show ownership of parking lots, to back lots, things like that, and really lights and cameras will help in that as well. So please um, come back and take a look at this slide and see what you can do for your own area. And then also, if you are interested, my contact information is on is at the end of the slide and the Redmond Police Department will come out and do an assessment of businesses. We've done it in the past and we're happy to come out to more locations. Uh, this is just a little bit on landscaping design. Um, if it fits in to your type of business, again, we're talking to lots of businesses here today. If it fits into your businesses, then that's great. Uh, if it doesn't, if, if it's just not feasible because maybe, um, maybe you're not in control and a property management company is, then please share your concerns with your property management company about things like lighting, um, tree height, hedge height, things like that and um, really just keeping the area clean and well-maintained. So, um, so if anything is broken, uh, if, if someone tries to break a window or a door, anyone driving by will be alerted quickly. And really um, just seeing what you can do to limit um, your business being an attractive location for criminals. Um, I'll talk a little bit about trespassing and loitering here in Redmond. I know that um, many businesses have had concerns and I've had lots of conversations with how we can keep uh, parking lots and businesses safe for patrons and maybe reduce the number of people that are camping or resting on private property. You have every right to ask someone to move along and not return to your business or your property. If you feel unsafe doing this, or you've asked in the past, please call us. Please use the emergency number. If, you, um, if you're concerned that it's not a real emergency, just you can say non-emergency, or you, can, you will be put on hold if the dispatcher deems that it's not an emergency, but a 911 call is coming in. So please give us a call at 911, and we'll respond and explain to the subject that they're trespassed from your location for a period of one year. Um, really, that's because they are, um, maybe they've stolen in the past, they're refusing to leave, and or they um, are causing a disturbance at your property. Um, we will keep that record in our computer system, and we can arrest them if they return. Uh, we are able to trespass from common areas from apartment complexes or um, maybe entire complexes that are owned by a single person or managed by one property management company. And next I have just a sample sign. You may have seen this around Redmond. Up top, it'll just say name of property and name of property management. These signs, um, I have the templates and you're welcome to have them. 
and uh, you can have these signs made into a, um, uh, an exterior sign. Uh, maybe here at, um, I know um, one of our local property management companies just used this and they went to Minuteman Press to have this done. So it will list prohibited contact conduct. We can, um, some of these can be limited. And um, so these things can be taken away under the prohibited contact if maybe those things aren't uh, a concern to you. But uh, but usually panhandling, um, loitering, trespassing, disturbing patrons, that can be a concern. If you are interested in posting this at your business, uh, please contact me. I'll get you the template and then you can have them printed on, um, at your own cost and you can make them the size that you would like. And then obviously if the Redmond police come across your business, and we see someone late at night, maybe um, maybe entry after hours, things like that on your property, we can explain that they need to move off of the property and they can be trespassed for that year. So this is our sample sign. You're welcome to have it. And um, again, please contact me if you need it. And again, I'm Anne-Marie Fine. I'm the Community Engagement Sergeant with the Redmond Police Department. My contact information is here on this slide and please feel free to, um, to reach out if you have any additional questions. And again, I'll stay on till the end, of course, to see if there's any questions from the group. And we do have some questions coming in, so okay. but we will hold all those to okay. the end. So now I'm going to turn it over to Nicole Perry. Nicole. All right, good morning. Thank you for having me today. All right, so I am the crime analyst for the Greater Puget Sound Financial Fraud and ID Theft Task Force. I work out of Redmond PD. So today I'm going to be kind of reviewing some methods by which a couple of different types of fraud are perpetrated and talk about how we can prevent them. Um, in general, in the last nine and a half years that I've been in the um, crime analyst position for the financial fraud task force, two of the um, most common types of scams and frauds that I see um, cause large losses all at once to businesses are business email compromises and imposter scams. So business email compromises are a uh, fraud incident where an employee's email account is compromised. They may have received a spear phishing email where they've clicked a malicious link um, or their login information has been stolen. On occasion, we see business email compromises um, come from spoofed email accounts as well. So a spoofed email account would be where as the fraudster has created a new um, separate email account um, and change the header information so that when they send an email, it looks like it came from someone inside the company. So the way that these are um, usually committed is inside a company, a request will be sent uh, to an internal coworker who has access to funds. So uh, particularly employees who work in HR, payroll, or finance are often targeted for these types of frauds. So an employee, for instance, in finance may receive an email request uh, to, to pay a vendor and have an, a fake invoice sent to them, for instance. Um, one variation of how this of this particular type of scam is a compromised employee account or a spoofed email account uh, may send a request to HR or payroll asking for lists of employee information or W-2 information. Uh, you may have seen uh, news articles about um, 
this type of variation for the scam where an HR employee receives a request for W-2 information. They send out a batch of information, including employee dates of birth, social security numbers, phone numbers, addresses, et cetera. And now we have a large data breach depending on the size of the company. Another variation of the business email compromise scam is for a payroll employee to receive a request to uh, change direct deposit information, for instance, from an employee. Um, and again, these can come from compromised email accounts where login information has been stolen and a hacker is actually sending the request from the legitimate employee's email address or they have spoofed the actual employee's email address so that it appears to be coming from internally, but it actually isn't. So imposter and extortion scams have um, a number of different types of variations or stories that are told to the victim. Um, one common theme is that instructions to the victim will always be to pay the scammer. Sometimes that is um, targeting an individual victim to pay a scammer in some kind of gift card or green dot cards, et cetera. We've also seen um, instructions to the victim to wire money to the scammer. Um, a couple of common variations of this scam are suspects posing as government officials, particularly uh, police departments, immigration, and the IRS. Um, other variations include impersonating uh, utility company personnel, um, so it's the variation where the scammers are impersonating uh, PSE employees or Seattle City Light has been in the news um, in our local press multiple times over the last few years where businesses receive a call from the scammer posing as a light company saying that your utility bill has not been paid or it's several months late. And um, there's a high pressure tactic on the employee to um, take funds often from a safe or a register and then either go buy gift cards, drop off cash um, or purchase Western Union or green dot cards, for instance. Um, as we've seen these impersonator and imposter types of scams um, evolve. The type of payment is constantly evolving. So for instance, once we um, thoroughly educate the public about the use or request from scammers for green dot cards, for instance, then they would start asking for iTunes gift cards. Once we start educating the public that they're using iTunes gift cards, they'll shift and I demand a different type of payment. So these particular types of scams rely heavily on uh, high pressure tactics. So the victim is threatened with arrest or loss of services or other high pressure consequences unless they pay immediately. So particularly for our small businesses in the area, the best way to prevent these types of scams from becoming successful and from um, your business losing money is training. Train your employees to know the signs of a phishing attempt, whether that's um, phishing, smishing, vishing. Um, smishing is by SMS text messages. Phishing is voice phishing, so phone calls, and then the traditional phishing emails. Um, so if you can train your employees to recognize um, emails that are including links, train them to report those emails to IT, delete the email, don't click on links in any emails that are unexpected, et cetera, 
those are a predominant way that uh, hackers will gain access to your to your system by targeting just a couple of employees to click on a malicious link that may download malware, et cetera. Particularly for the business email compromise types of scams, um, it's important to implement a checks and balances system for your business or some kind of two-factor two authentication for any high-risk requests. So high-risk requests might be um, adjusting invoices, any change to the amount of typical vendor payments, any change in account information to vendor payments. So for example, um, I have read police reports where a payroll or uh, rather finance um, employee was targeted with an email that appeared to come from the CEO or CFO of a company requesting that a vendor payment um, be sent to a different account from the account that had been used for that certain vendor for a number of years. So if you're implementing a system of checks and balances, rather than relying simply on an email from the CFO, uh, your finance employee might be trained to get a voice-to-voice, -voice, a phone call confirmation um, with the CFO or with an authorized party within the business to change any account information like that. Um, another example would be um, changing, changing your process for payroll for how employees enroll or change uh, their direct deposit information rather than just taking an email or a form submitted by email, there might be a page on your in, on your intranet system um, for employees to submit that information. So here I have some examples of text messages um, and a phishing email, um, a couple of warning signs to look for, particularly for us as individuals. If you're receiving a text message, um, you'll notice that the 800 number is linked in the text message. Um, you would be training employees and also as individuals not to click on links. Don't call the number from the message. You would call the known number for your bank. Um, and that includes the bank for your business account, for instance. Um, specific to small businesses, you're more likely to be targeted with email phishing campaigns than text messaging, probably. Um, and so you would train employees to watch for um, any unexpected emails with a link, um, phone numbers, um, one definite warning sign in phishing emails is to look for poor grammar or a lot of spelling mistakes particularly are very common in phishing emails. Um, it's increasingly common to see phishing emails appearing to come from software vendors. So a phishing email might look as if it's come from Microsoft and prompt you to click a link to log into your account to quote, restore access or something of that nature. So you would want to make sure to train your employees not to click on any links in those types of messages to go directly to their login system or to contact IT. Some general warning signs for uh, scams, particularly are imposter scams and extortion scams. Um, government agencies will never demand payment to avoid enforcement action. So this is relevant for um, the calls from scammers pretending to be IRS or immigration enforcement or from the police department. Um, that includes jury duty scams. Um, where the suspects will call and tell an individual that they've missed 
jury duty and that they're going to be arrested if they don't pay uh, thousands of dollars immediately. Um, particularly for small business owners, also be, be wary of uh, sales calls from customer service representatives who are overly pushy, over, overly aggressive. So for instance, they may be pretending to sell um, a software package or, um, or membership in a local networking group or something of that nature. And so if those customer service, alleged customer service representatives are overly pushy, that's a warning sign um, that what they're trying to convince you to buy into may be a scam. So to help both your customers and your employees um, identify scams before they fall victim, there are some resources where you can sign up for alerts, particularly fbi.gov. You can sign up for alerts there. Um, those alerts are not necessarily specific to small businesses, but a lot of the uh, scams and frauds that target individuals are often used to also target small businesses, um, small to medium-sized businesses. Uh, Snopes.com is a great place to search for um, rumor information, for instance, if you've ever seen, um, if you've seen the Facebook posts that make the rounds every couple of years, Facebook is gonna start charging or Twitter's doing this or Instagram is doing that. Um, if you kind of search the topic with Snopes, um, the first couple of links will usually be um, to a Snopes article confirming or busting um, that myth or confirming whether a story is true. IDTheftCenter.org has um, some great resources for victims. And the AARP Fraud Watch Network also sends out email updates and notifications for scams and frauds. So particularly if you've fallen victim to a scam as an employee or a business owner, um, we do ask that you file a report with local law enforcement um, as quickly as you can. If you have wired money, particularly MoneyGram, Western Union, or purchased green dot cards, uh, you can individually call the wire transfer service to see if the money has been picked up on the receiving end yet. If not, if you're calling the 800 customer service number, they may be able to pull the money back and cancel the transaction if it has not yet been picked up. Law enforcement can also assist you with contacting the wire transfer service. And I believe the slides will all be available. Um, after the presentation. So I've included 800 contact numbers for kind of the, the top three uh, wire transfer services. We also encourage you to file a complaint with the Federal Trade Commission. Um, and particularly for uh, scams where someone's impersonating or um, advertising for a fake business. We're trying to convince businesses to join an organization that doesn't really exist. We also encourage you to file a complaint with the attorney general's office. So my contact information is on this uh, last slide. I am a non-commissioned civilian employee. So I do not um, write police reports, for instance. So if you need to report a new fraud, you would want to contact our dispatch either by calling 911 or calling the non-emergency number that's listed there. They both go to the same call center. Um, if you have questions or are looking for victim resources, um, feel free to contact me directly for that. Thank you, Nicole. And now we're going to begin the Q&A portion of our program. And a reminder, we are recording this webinar and we'll send out a transcript of the questions and answers with uh, some of the links in the webinar and the slides and the resources a follow up to you. So our first question, I believe is for Anne-Marie. It asks, um, I would like an update on efforts to address homeless. 
I think it meant homelessness. Uh, have we have seen an increase in unreported car break-ins? So um, I would say that our homelessness numbers are not increasing dramatically here in Redmond. Uh, we do have a really great partnership between the police department here and our homeless outreach, as well as in the last couple of years, we have um, dedicated funds to hire, and we do have on staff a full-time mental health professional that gives us great access to um, services, as well as treatment options and um, resources for anyone experiencing homelessness, especially uh, when we work together with maybe uh, Friends of Youth or um, Over Lake Christian Church, things like that, where um, there's safe parking, there's resources, and also um, there's resources uh, every week when we have community court here at the Redmond Library. So, um, so we are doing a really good job of providing as many services as we can. We still do not allow anyone experiencing homelessness to reside in our parks. We do not allow camping uh, in public spaces. We, anytime we find tents, things of that nature on city property or on private property, um, they are told to move immediately. City property, we usually give them maybe um, 48 to 72 hours, but we also offer services with that. Private property is different. Uh, private property is allowed to clearly trespass anyone staying on their property at any time if they're there unlawfully, and we will help move, um, move them off the property if need be. All right, thank you. All right, I'm, I'm going through our list of questions. So I wanna make sure that I'm giving you guys uh, equal opportunity to answer these. So the next question is uh, from Nicole uh, and or for Nicole, not from Nicole, it's for Nicole. Um, it asks, is there a recommended employee training program for internet safety and recognizing scams? Um. Not that I am aware of. Um, also, as government employees, I would not be able to recommend or um, or endorse any um, private companies, for instance. Um, I am available to assist with presentations uh, such as this one um, and our um, community outreach team with Sergeant Fine would also be available for um, presentations similar to this. All right, thank you. And I, we totally understand not being able to recommend a, a private company. Um, and maybe that's something our team can look at to see if there's um, any um, leaders in, in that field that we might be able to put together for some folks. All right, next question is for Anne-Marie. It says, asks, my store had, had break-ins November 2021 and January of this year. The catalytic converter was stolen off my mobile store short bus parked at the Motley Zoo. Purses stolen out of break room and shop, shoplifting open during open hours. Thank you for putting on this webinar. Uh, what suggestions do you have for me? Uh, well, Gosh, I'm so sorry that all that long list there is, um, you know, with one business, I, I understand that that is a, a huge hit to your business, both in security for your personal security, as well as financially. Uh, the catalytic converter issue is huge right now. We did offer um, just this last weekend uh, at the um, Redmond uh, Public Works Maintenance Yard, we did offer our first catalytic converter uh, etching event. I know that's not going to solve all of them. I know that um, not everybody can make those events. It actually filled up very quickly. We're hoping to put on another one. Uh, for, for work vehicles, if the catalytic converter is exposed, I would recommend contacting a service company, a, an auto service company, and finding out which shields for underneath the vehicle will fit your maintenance vehicles. It is an expense. Uh, it's not a huge expense, or even if 
additional brackets can be um, can be welded on. It's not a huge expense, but it will in the long run, if somebody tries to take your catalytic converter, it will save you a ton of money. Right now, um, depending on the damage they do, one cutting, plus finding the new catalytic converters, it can be thousands of dollars, plus your vehicle can be out of commission for a while if needed, or if, if necessary, depending on the damage they do, yanking it out. So, um, so I would look into putting those shields underneath, especially um, if you have work vehicles, because, um, because it is a huge expense to repair that. And it's taking some time right now with the back orders. So um, additionally, uh, any kind of locked, um, locked areas for employee break rooms that can be provided or, um, you know, and, and really providing those locked areas so those personal things aren't left in people's vehicles. Car prowls are a huge issue in Redmond. You know, it's windows all around a car. You can look in, see what's there. If there's anything, even if it's a gym bag, because you don't know what's inside of it, there's a chance that someone will smash that window and, and try to get in there. So really take the opportunity to clean out your cars. Uh, don't ask employees not to leave personal items in the cars. Explain to them what a problem it is here in Redmond and have them bring those items inside if they really, really need them. And then also lock those things up. Oh, great. Thank you. All right. Next question is for Nicole. Uh, and it says, I am a business owner and I've personally been receiving daily scam calls stating that they're with my credit card company and or a credit agency and they can help enhance my credit card offering with lower interest rates, etc. They seem to have some personal data, including my social security number. And these calls are coming in daily, multiple times a day. I've contacted my credit card company, added my phone numbers to the national do not call list. What else can be done? Um, if you're certain that the scammer already has your social security number, um, I would recommend locking your credit. Um, so with legislation about four years ago now, I think um, locking your credit is now free. Um, so you would need to actually lock your credit with each of the three main um, credit bureaus. However, if the scammer is just claiming that they have your social security number, um, then that would be kind of up to your best judgment um, to decide whether to preemptively lock your credit or not. Um, so particularly if you're not applying for any new lines of credit, any new loans, um, then there's not necessarily any harm to locking your credit. Um, previously, um, in, in Washington, it could be inconvenient to lock your credit um, because auto insurance um, was using credit scores to set as part of their calculation to set rates. However, in Washington, they can't do that anymore. Um, so locking your credit down will no longer affect your auto insurance. So Unfortunately, oh, adding your phone number to the do not call list doesn't prevent scammers from calling you anyway, because they're not checking the do not call list. Only <laughs> legitimate companies are actually checking the, the do not call. If only there was some magic place. <laughs> we could do that, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. So this next question is for Anne-Marie. Um, and the question is, um, do you have any recommendations of types of exterior cameras and motion lighting to install? Um, I don't think it's recommended for companies, um, but if there's, if you can't actually give like brand names, maybe you could give us kind of a parameter of uh, what these, um, like uh, tech, the technical capabilities of these products. Sure, um, I, I don't have a specific camera brand. Um, obviously, I, I'm, I'm you know, I'm not sponsored by them, but uh, I, I would definitely, if, if you are willing to spend the money, then I would, um, there, there's quite a few places that will come out and do an exterior assessment of your business and recommend cameras and even provide the installation. Uh, if you do, you know, some physical security searches on Google, you can find some companies and maybe, um, maybe here at One Redmond, there's um, some type of even a, um, 
you know, a bulletin board or something where people can share if they've had good experiences with one of these companies. But I will say, if you are looking for cameras, then make sure if you want the cameras to work at night, that either they have that capability or you're adding the lighting that is going to be necessary to light up the maybe the parking lot or the back of the yard. It is um, sometimes maybe lights are just by the back door, but if your um, vehicles that are parked on site are the concern, then you really need to have maybe motion lighting um, that's facing outward and looking at the parking lot and not just right next to the back door of the build, of the business. All right, and I have a lot of noise on my end, so let me know if there's any problems of hearing me. Um, this is more of a statement, I think uh, someone wanted to uh, kind of alert everybody else. Uh, they said, I got a text message that says said it was from my bank about suspicious charges. And when I text responded, no, they called me and made it look like the call was from my bank. And then they tried to give me my two uh, factor ad auth authorization codes and passwords. So um, there wasn't really a question in that, but just letting people know this is yet another way that people are trying to get information from you. All right, so the next question uh, for or Nicole, I believe, or, or maybe maybe Anne-Marie says, I believe I may be a victim of employee theft. What can I do to best deter this in the future? Well, employee theft's a really hard one because uh, I know right now it's hard to find skilled employees and, um, and we don't all have the ability to do very long background checks on employees as well. Um, definitely doing some type of uh, previous employment check and talking with uh, whoever that employee worked for before is a huge help to see if they had any problems with the employee. I really, um, as Nicole was talking about having those checks and balances when it comes to financial things, really the same thing applies when it comes to um, the cash register at the end of the day or the um, you know, access to your um, blank checks at your, at your business. Uh, if you, having those checks and balances and having a set up program where, okay, at this time at the end of the day or this time at the end of the week, we're gonna go through everything, uh, it really, really helps. And then all, if you're having a cash drawer managed by multiple people, it does get a little bit messy. Um, I would say it, it's not um, it's not always the, the best thing to do, but if you need to do any kind of, um, of cameras that do watch your employees, you can certainly do that in your business. Uh, if you're going to tell the employees about it, I would have cameras then everywhere in the business. So it's not obviously just directed toward them, but um, you can also do, um, you know, in a public space, you are allowed to put cameras up. It, it's, it's not an issue. You don't have to tell everybody, but um, I do like it to prevent shoplifting and things like that. You know, a small sign that says, you know, smile, you are on camera or something to that effect. And that kind of covers your employees as well, that they know that they will be on camera too. If you do have suspicions, um, there are ways to kind of uh, validate those with, with new policies and procedures or to uh, enlist somebody else you can trust to also uh, watch for things for you. All right, that's great. And we are kind of a little bit over time. So I, I wanna go ahead and wrap this up. Um, I'd love for each of you to give us kind of our, like kind of the takeaway that you want folks to remember from this. And Nicole, let's start with you. All right, um, I guess my main takeaway for business owners is to really emphasize training, um, training for yourself, training for employees to prevent falling victim to the scams that we can prevent so that that frees up resources um, to be able to investigate uh, the fraud and scams that we can't prevent. All right, Anne-Marie, your last uh, note to the webinar viewers. Well, um, in my time in patrol and in detectives, when I was maybe doing a very long case, I would get, be getting it ready to send to the prosecutor's office. And the whole thing before 
I would send it, I would think, okay, I'm going to think like a defense attorney. Where are the holes? What do I need to say? What am I missing? Um, and for business owners, for property managers, I really just want to say, go think like a criminal. Where, go around your business. Where would you go? Look at your business in the morning. Look at your business in the middle of the night. Where would you go? Where are the holes? Um, if, um, if it's a, a store that's selling something inside the business, where's your line of sight? Where can you be concealed? And that's where you put the cameras. That's where you put the lights. So really empower yourself to think like a criminal and, um, and maybe then you can prevent some of this from going on. And to call us if there's anything suspicious. Suspicious acts are what, um, are what we're interested in before it gets to the point of a criminal act. So please give the Redmond Police a call and we'll try to get there as soon as possible. And remember the Redmond Police will do a walkthrough of your business. So that's also another thing to keep in mind. So thank you everyone. This concludes our program for today. Thank you, Nicole and Anne-Marie for being our speakers and giving us your time and expertise. We appreciate you all very much. Uh, a, a reminder that One Redmond is here to assist you in your business. We are a hub of information and have a wealth of contacts uh, with the goals of supporting our local businesses. So as I close the program today, I wanna give a big thank you to all of you for participating in the webinar today. So until we see you again, this concludes our program. Thank you for coming.